Thank you. Okay, so I'm using two screens. Uh, one is for sharing and one is for watching the chat. And uh, I hope this is, I want to make this interactive. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to your feedback. It would have been great if we were in the same room uh, to get opinions from people and you know your, your feedback about your thoughts because there are lots of questions which I'm going to ask uh, in this presentation. So to start with, uh, to, to start the interaction, it would be good if you could, uh, if you have a second device like me, type in this URL or either, you know, open this up on your phone and this will open up, uh, you know, some of the questions and you'd be able to interact with me. And while you're doing that, uh, uh, so I have, so the, the title today is to talk about the work on the I2B2 uh, network in India, but I do have a second title. And the second, and I think that's because our work is happening in the larger context. And the second title is that I2B2, that I, we often hear, I often write in my papers that I2B2 is deployed in 400 hospitals. But then I feel just 400, why not 10K? You know, w, if you go to WHO site, it says that if you go to WHO, uh, site, it lists 10,000 hospitals. And I don't understand why it can't be helpful to all these institutions. Why just 400 academic centers? Okay. So let's delve a bit deeper into that. So to get started off, okay, uh, it would be good if you could just select what roles you play. And a lot of us play multiple roles. I see that there are 50 people on the call and just 12 responses. Maybe I'll just wait for a minute for people to log in, but I'll keep this going uh, while, while I continue and we'll, we'll come back to the slide later. Okay. So when, so this is the, the you know, total uh, daily new confirmed cases of COVID with Jack, uh, uh, with Jack was talking about the 4C project. Uh, these are cases happening over the last six months. And you could see, you can see over here that it's different in different parts of the world. And thankfully in India, the wave uh, is, second wave is coming, is coming down now. And I want you to have a look at this picture. Uh, it's a geopolitical map of the world. And I just have, uh, when the work in India began, I was in these two cities, Mumbai and Pune, and I wanted to contrast, you know, and that is kind of a theme for this talk that you have the sites, the 4C effort majorly focused and the research effort focused in the United States and Europe, obviously involving, you know, a few other countries, but then you have the rest of the world. And India over here to me represents the rest of the world. Uh, and the 4C effort, which Sean described, you know, you have a lot of hospitals, you know, all this work, uh, about characterizing and using EHR data to characterize what's happening with COVID, um, having 342 or more hospitals right now. So it's a bit different. Also, you will see that if you look at PubMed and if you query for COVID publications, you will see there is concentration in the United States and Europe. And and you could you can quick you can see that it may not be applicable. To the rest of the world because the, the demographics are different the genotypes are different the virus is different but that's what's happening that uh, given the lack of local production of knowledge you have to depend on others to uh, and you know to generate and maybe uh, and apply information which may not be applicable so let's uh, we'll go a bit deeper into the theme and the total number of cases, you know, and the total number of deaths, 3.76 million. So who is responsible? I would, you know, could the pandemic have been mitigated? I would say it's rather helpful to say who is, who has a responsibility for the future pandemic? I think it is me, you know, it's, I would, you would agree with me that it is useful to say that it is me. I think it is the I2B2 community. It is all those people who have ownership of the learning health system. Now, if you may not agree with that, but you may agree with me that if we have a responsive healthcare system for COVID, it could have 
at least the following components. So you would have forces which are applying clinical knowledge, and these are the providers working with payers. Now it's becoming difficult to distinguish between the two. They're applying knowledge at ground zero and and trying to address and, and do the best they can for the patients. And hoping that somebody does a discovery of what works and what doesn't work. And hoping that the pharma come, pharmas invest and come up with new therapies. And also hoping that the academia, actually traditionally the academia plays the role. On the other side, you have the academia, which is actually doing the discovery and disseminating what the knowledge is and how providers should act and what the best care is. Um, okay, and the government is actually staging this by, it has policies about ethics, privacy and confidentiality and economic policy. So the government sets the stage for all these actors to act. And in COVID, what was required for them, what was required of the providers was to rapidly act and mainly had to deal with logistical challenges, right? The pharma had, had to invest, make investments. And the government on its own had to make radical decisions. Now, all these things require evidence. And the government had to make decisions about funds for the care directly and also for the therapies to be invented. And they had to come up with guidance from somewhere about to the providers and to public about how to act. And this wheel you see is the wheel of the learning health system. And I2B2 has a very important role over there. So imagine an, an I2B2 pandemic response system. Now I came up with this slide when I was in India sitting in uh, the emergency response room where we had patients calling the, the town hall patients who didn't, who had COVID, but one were not getting a bed. And I could quickly see over there, like, you know, that as, as less, as more and more patients get, you know, as the curve was surging, as more and more people get, uh, you know, get COVID, they're not going to find beds. And there was a need, there was a practical need to triage. And the variable that now, which was there was the partial pressure of oxygen. Even if we had one more variable, to predict who's going to become severe, it would have helped a lot. And EHRs were there, you know, in the city where I were in, electronic data was being collected, the expertise was there, but we couldn't, we couldn't put the thing together at that point in time to really help uh, and predict who's severe. And this could have actually saved life. And it, it was a wake up call for me to see that everything is there, but it's just not falling into place. And this experience is not over here. And we could even talk about our you know, work in the United States that we have developed these severity models. And Epic actually does have a severity score. And that's a bit controversial about how it got there. Uh, but it is possible to do this. And, but who is going to do it? Who, you know, who, who can put these pieces together? I think I2B2 can. And there are a lot of projects that we are doing, uh, I'm going to talk about, which, which can, take a big step in this direction. So notice over here that traditionally, the traditional use case for I2B2 is to do epidemiology. We have our I2B2 instances updated once a quarter or once a month, and we do it to identify what cohorts are important and maybe for clinical trials. But notice here that we're talking about a near real time, it doesn't have to be real time, it got to be daily update of the I2B2 data and we're talking about infrastructure which would automatically develop ML models and apply them. And there's a whole science over here required and ethics, actually it's not, it appears simple, but it's a lot difficult, but not impossible to deploy these models and you know monitor them and so on. And you can have a dashboard going to the public health or the government institutions or people you know, who manage policy, uh, obviously helping the research or the study staff at the site. And there's a there's a stream which goes out to international collaboration like 4CE where you can validate the general generalization of the findings and share the models and so on. Okay, so let me just stop here and
go back to our interactive slide and ask you this question. Do you see whether that an I2B2 network can in fact reduce a pandemic's mortality in the future? I'd love to see your feedback on this. So let that go, let that uh, go through while people are, are responding. I'm glad that everybody seems to agree. And if you don't agree, uh, I would be interested in knowing why not. Okay, so this is what we proposed in India uh, to the government, you know, the, the National Digital Health Mission, which is the counterpart of the ONC in India. That okay, we could actually do this at a district level. We could accumulate data from hospitals at one site. And we could connect them via Shrine network, and and you know the, it is it is interesting and it's what we are pursuing. Having that, having hospitals have I two B two, you we could do answer these questions. You know, uh, we could answer these questions in the future. How to triage patients? What are what is availability of beds? These are logistical questions which can be asked. How to monitor? You know, the key uh, use of key medications because there are all kinds of guidelines and you know. Uh, physicians may follow a guideline which was from last month, or they may understand it differently. So you can actually see what medications are being used and actually conserve important medications. And you can predict, maybe you can predict what you know infrastructure needs you're going to need. And I, I, I see that a lot of work happened at the Mayo Clinic about about uh, you know about this modeling about you know and and I do data, data in the hospital can be helpful for that. And uh, the whole goal is to minimize mortality. And you'll see this uh, publications from the Indian press about uh, that. And this, this feeling that data is here and you know it is all siloed out. But interestingly in this, you see that there is information about vaccination and you know who is uh, uh, and, and how, how, how people have recovered and the strains, but there's no, no mention of EHR data. In fact, there is, this people have not realized that electronic health records are being used in India, though not as much in an elaborate way as in the US, but there are, it is there and, uh, and they can literally, literally be leveraged. So an important goal of our work over here is to really bring the EHR data into the picture. And I think uh, there is a lot. Kavi, sorry. Sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we have someone raise their hand. Would you like to wait for questions at the end or, or, or would you be open to having questions drop in when they arise? How would you like to go? I think it's good to uh, you know, answer when they arrive. So I'll, I'll uh, like to hear the question. Perfect. Um, the question's coming from, from Gil. We're gonna ask Gil to unmute him himself. That's awesome. Yes, Gil. Gil, I think you're still muted. There you go. I was earlier. I was stimulated by your question about whether having I two B two in place in India or anywhere else would make a big difference, and um, I, I just felt that the response was out of our control. It de the response depends upon politicians and health departments and all kinds of uh, people with responsibilities to the state, local and national level. But I get to the point that surely we could have them better informed even if they have to take action we can't control. Yeah, Gil, that's a really important point and that came uh, a lot in India. Even when I was talking to, to hospital, you know, deans and directors, you know, and informaticians, they felt that it is not their job. It is somebody else's job. And the problem is that you know, it is not, in fact, it is, it is, uh, you know, I mean, it's just that they have not done it before. It's just that you have not done it before. So you have bioinformaticians, people analyzing data. It's just that they have not dealt with health EHR data before. So, and, and the government doesn't have this kind of a machinery, you know, in place because of policy or whatever. So everybody needs to take a step outside their comfort zone. Um, and then, then that is possible. Um, and I think because we kind of lay claim on learning health system, and you know, I think we do, as Zach said, have have an important, very important role to play. Uh, and and I think more can be done. 
to connect the work that we have to policymakers. Uh, and I, and I, I love to, actually, that's a question I want to ask the audience. What more can be done, not just in India, but even over here? I mean, I'm surprised, uh, I, I'm, well, while following the 4C work and participating in it, I was kind of waiting to see how this informs public health and you know even the government response. So I think that's a topic open for discussion. How how that can be done? But I think that's important. Very good. Yeah. Thanks. So, what's the current state of the I2B2 network in India? Okay. That this is like work over the last three four months, and a little bit more before that too. So we contacted fourteen hospitals, at least had one in person, you know, one meeting with them. And in uh, five of those hospitals, the leadership approved. Now, whenever we go to a hospital, you re we realized over time that three people need to agree for really things to move forward. One is that you require a clinical champion. Secondly, you require the hospital management to be on board. And thirdly, you, you require a decent IT staff in the hospital, or at least some collaborator who can help them uh, with the IT part. So five of the sites are, uh, approved the leadership approved and they are they either have got irb approval or in the process of submission two of them did and we look at why they didn't and you know where they are and we realized last month that any health research happening in india requires approval from the ministry of health and that itself can take a few months and uh, so we are preparing for that and we are going in with four sites and there is need for funding uh, and we, uh, you know, even small amount of funding, a seed funding is important. But we have currently about four sites installing I2B2 for operational use even before you know the approval is in place because it's not for research, it's not a research application, it's for practical operational use. And to write the papers and do publication and to collaborate for CE, the IRB approval is required. Okay. And so what are the challenges here? Now the challenges here are that the just checking on the time. The challenges here are that the uh, human resources. So you know, human resources are different. So people, tooling, and uh, methods, right? So uh, in India, the clinician uh, or rest of the world, the clinical profile is different. They are heavily there is a huge patient volume. There is tremendous clinical skill, but there is less reward if you go down the research path as and the research path is not well established there's a lot of you know mentoring required probably because the government has not invested a lot in clinical research so that's not an attractive track uh, or not or not a track which clinicians easily take up uh, so it's difficult to find clinicians who have who are interested in asking who understand research methodology ask are interested in asking a research question also the it infrastructure because it's new ehrs are coming on they lack expertise and the the manpower that we have here uh, for security, for you know, for digital health, the IRBs are traditionally used to clinical trials, and they have a different set of jargons and terminologies which they understand. And I ran there are two words in the template that we prepared for 4C, you know, participant 4C, which ran, you know, which actually always raised a question with the IRBs at these sites. I need to go back. One is they used to ask, is this a prospective or a retrospective study? And I had to explain that, oh, it is actually retrospective, but we are updating, building the cohort every month or every quarter. Uh, and because that's treated differently. And second thing, the word sharing. Now, sharing population level counts. Now, in, in we are, you know, it's well, we know that in the 4C, none of the sites shares patient level data with the other site. It is a population level summary counts, which are shared with the central site. And collaboratively analyze. Now, this population level sharing allows you to validate the generalization and see what themes are there and you know what the patterns are. But the word share and summary data is actually what scared many people off just because they have not done it before. And, and it takes a bit of time and handholding to explain, but I'm sure we, we, we want to you know, work on that line and explain you know, that, that. So that is the most critical statement which is kind of coming in the way or the challenge which needs to be addressed to take things forward. Secondly, okay, that's a hospital administration concern about sharing data and what exactly is being shared. We have the health ministry screening. Also, you for any funding to go from the United States or NIH, you know, from, from anywhere to, to India, 
those sites need to have these FERA accounts to receive international funding. And obviously there is need for, need for funds to you know, make this happen. And that, that's also a concern that when, whenever hospitals come on board, they're worried that, okay, am I, is this going to be a drain of money for me? Because they're in any ways like cash trapped right now because of COVID and all these things. And typically they don't have a great budget for, for research and for this. And so this, the work presented here is effort of a lot of people, especially Love Patil, I want to mention here. And, you know, and Sean and Zach and Griffin, uh, really, uh, you know, encouraging, you know, and, and driving, uh, setting the tone for this. David Golan has been a great help, you know, advisor for this. And Amazon, I talk a bit about Amazon, how Amazon has come forward and helping. This company, Indo Health in India, is, uh, is a startup uh, also playing an important role. So this is the work done by Amazon. Now, we quickly realized that, I, I actually realized that, uh, that if this were to happen in India, where in and we were, would have to have I2B to install in hospitals, where the security awareness and privacy awareness is where work is needed there, I felt it's important to have an enclave, just like we have, you know, in the, in the United States when we pool data, right? So this enclave is where I2B2 can reside. And uh, I'll, I'll talk about this later on in detail. So what it basically means is there is a a, a virtual private cloud where data can't go in and out. There are no data connections except via this file sharing service, which is audited. And you can connect into the instance by using remote desktops where your connection is encrypted pixels. You cannot move data in and out. So whatever goes in and out is audited, you know, and there's a trail kept. And that is very important. I think going to be very important when we take this forward and you know maybe make networks in india this will may, uh, will play a very important role on prem is important mostly if people want to go on prem but they understand that the security provided by the cloud vendors would be very helpful in the long run okay also notice that see when you install i2b2 over here uh, you know in, in in the united states for me it took several months when i first did it and you know, and so we had done a lot of, we have done a lot of work on Docker, which was presented in the last few years and it's running in the cloud and all that. And also we have developed this ETL module, which we are piloting. So what is the ETL module? So ETL module is a tab inside the web client, which you have modified where one can quickly within a few minutes of installing I2B2 upload data. And you don't need to understand all those tables inside I2B2. Uh, you don't need to know those, all those fields. All you need to know to upload data is four columns, who, when, and what. You don't have to worry what type of the what type of data it is. And you know, you, ha you have a concept file coming from uh, a central, you know, central uh, data model, which will tell you that. And it's very easy to upload data. And I think that is very important uh, given the expertise, you know, how quickly people can do things. Uh, and so I want to invite you tomorrow for the 10:30 a.m. ETL workgroup presentation, where we'll have a hands-on on this, and this, uh, you know, and you can have a hands-on session. So we've got 60 workspaces set up where you can come and play with it. Okay, so uh, what is the road ahead? I don't know, wrap up. I got 15 more minutes. So what's the road ahead? Three things: methods, tools, and people. Methods. Now, 4C has been doing a lot of work about proving that using EHR, using a federated architecture and using EHR data, which all its noise and biases, you can still do effective hypothesis testing. That is what we've been trying to, we always have guarded opinions about what we find. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work required to, to prove that, and it is needed to prove that large noisy data is bet is equivalent to small accurate data. You know, data which has been collected traditionally how epidemiology happens. Data, you know, patients are followed up and data is collected manually. And here you have EHR data which is noisy, but it is huge in amount. And that hugeness allows you to any overcome the noise and it is cheap, right? So I2P2 re represents that that approach in which you're using large freely available cheap data to, un uh, to answer important questions. 
and it's important to identify limitations also of this approach so that methodology work is required required tools methods alone you can write the best of algorithms but if they are not available to easily to people it's going to have a very limited impact so we have been developing uh, so we have done the cloud deployment and you can have i2b to install in a few minutes uh, you know if you look at the docker containers which are there in the i2b to github we have developed this etl tool and uh, the etl tool can help you get started within a few minutes you should be able to upload data i2b2 we have we've been working on making a tabulation and you know, i2b2 typically gives out counts but now it has the ability to generate tables uh, uh, and you know, we, that api is coming out soon we have developed a restful api uh, you know a little bit uh, restful api way which you could have data flowing in one patient at a time and data flowing out one patient at a time and machine learning models so we are putting developing machine learning models so these tools these tooling is coming out of a project at mgb where we are deploying i2b2 in the clinical space for population management so this is a ro or grant to develop machine learning modules on i2b2 so i invite you people on this call companies developers to collaborate and and use some of these tools uh, and contribute to them overall the approach here i think what's important is to be less esoteric uh, i think i i should say that in in the academic committee uh, in, in community it in the short term helps to sound the to be the most intelligent person in the room and say things which only few people understand that way you appear intelligent but it's you have to be we have to be more inclusive we have to really dumb down dumb down in the sense make it very simple for people to understand the concepts of data management and actually they are very simple we sometimes unnecessarily make them complicated so that's an important part over here in in this tooling uh, and thirdly is the people that you know there is a tremendous opportunity and we have seen that in the 4c community that when you know it, there is a opportunity to mentor uh clinicians and informaticians over the world forming those work groups it really that education mission really flows through in those projects and there is a need to expand the use cases we just shouldn't think of use cases of i2b2 typically right now a tool for clinical trial actually i2b2 can be used for so many different use cases and population health is one which we click with we are closely looking at um and we look at some other use cases in the last slide um and i think this is a question there is this, this sensitivity to exposing population level api uh you want to want to look at this api from the all of us projects it it actually allows you to query the population to a certain extent one variable at a time and it says it doesn't allow cross tabulation because it is a way to protect participant privacy and stigma stigmatization of specific groups of people i think more needs to work needs to be done about exposing level the population level api because i think that exposing that population level api if hospitals can do that to payers to pharma to government agencies the more they can contribute to be part of the learning health system uh, so i think that this is very important uh, and how can i to be to be a part of i to be to already has this and it has got those pr privacy you know uh, functions where it you know you can set an limit that okay if your number of counts was less than 20 or 100 whatever it's going to give give uh, it's not going to go below that number so it you can limit the query to particular size of patients so that i2b2 has a very important role um, okay let me again take you back while i'm at this slide so everybody has said true thankfully let me take you back to this slide i'm like a little bit hijacking a little bit of the conversation i want people here to express to rate these so we have we have all these features coming out but it would be great if you could rate what is important what you personally think is important and we could prioritize them uh, so let me explain one is the batch etl module which i explained to you very simple module where you can quickly load i2b2 data into second thing is the rest api making i2b2 real time uh, we have that developed we use it and we want to release it out in open source for the i2b2 community the fire api uh, work needs to be done there the machine learning api Uh, where you could develop models in i2b2 and share them and develop them and deploy them in the institution uh, now not everybody has the expertise of the great academic institutions that we have here imagine i2b2 is running in these hospitals where the expertise is not there it's got to be very simple to 
run and deploy those modules. So there's a lot of work required. So that is the machine learning API refers to that. Cloud deployment is a Docker container containerization. Security, there's a lot of work required on security to assure people that in fact, you know, the I2B2 is very secure. I mean, it is already is, but the, what I really do more, more work in that direction. And all of this can't happen, I think, without, without industry participation. Uh, and we have to look at how it can be expanded to new, ge ge new geographics, like we are geographies, like we're doing it in India. So please do rate these topics and how important you feel they are and how useful they are for your day-to-day -day work. So I'll give it, give this a minute or two. Still have ten minutes left. Here we start a countdown. Give it a few seconds. Maybe that's too much. Okay. Um, Maybe 10 more seconds. So we've got 14 votes and people are saying that, yeah, the ETL model is important. The RESTful API is a mixed response. Machine learning, people say are useful, not so much. Security, people have rated very important. Okay. Let's move on to the next one. Now, in fact, for these topics, would you be willing to be a beta tester or be interested in co-developing? So if yes, just select the, you know, the topics or the modules you are interested in and we'll reach out to you, uh, uh, reach out to you in, in, you know, in the, in the uh, as things go, go ahead, especially with the batch ETL, we, we, uh, that will be coming out in the next week or two. We are looking for beta testers right now. And the REST API and the tabulation API would be coming out in the, you know, uh, in the coming, in the rest of the year. So I'll let you answer that. And once you finish this, make sure to, in, you know, include your email so that we can reach out to you if you are interested in, in, in really co-developing and participating. So I think what's important in the end is, it, you know, I2B2 just can't be, I don't think it's practical to have it just supported by funding and research grants. It has to demonstrate economic gains to the players, especially to the hospitals to sustain. Now, if you look at a hospital, how can a hospital really derive value from population health? I think I2B2 needs to ask that question. I2B2 needs to enable hospitals to derive value from population health data. Now, what are the different avenues? One is decision support and logistical planning. Here, the conversation is about saving money. It's not generating more revenue. Research funds, that's typically how it has been. And when research funds are there, I2B2 is there, it's used for projects. And that could that is an important thread, but I think it shouldn't be totally dependent on that. Government, there could be money coming from the government you know, for policy making, for public health things. And you know that's something which can be explored. How I2B2 can be used by hospitals to collaborate with pharmas and with payers. And we have a lot of commercial, you know, entities in that space. You know, people need to take that up. We have Trinitex really exploring the, you know, really taking up the, you know, interface between population, you know, between hospitals and pharma for population health. We have other players who are offering services and building on things. I want you to look at this company called Trueta. Okay, so I want to stop stop here, and I know uh, five more minutes left. In summary, I feel there is considerable opportunity for advancing public health and medical research in low resource settings. And I, I, I want to ask the question, uh, why not in the US and Europe? How, you know, how can, you know, what is the value of opening up this ecosystem for, you know, uh, for public health institutions and for the government, you know, policy makers? And there really is a need to expand I2B2 to the newest cases, uh, like especially population health and with, you know, with other entities here. So let me stop here and you know open it up. I, I think it's very important in the end, or for for I two B two. How can I two B two enables hospital to derive value from population health? I think that's if you don't remember anything in this presentation, but that one sentence, I think the job job is done. Thank you Kavi, so much. Yeah, Kavi, we have a question. Somebody, Oryx Sachs has his hand raised, so I'm gonna 
allow sure. him to unmute. Ulrich, Thanks. go ahead and unmute. Thanks. Okay, I think I'll unmute you. So thank you for your wonderful talk, Kavi. That was excellent to see uh, from this perspective. Uh, my, my question would be, uh, could you just contrast the use scenarios um, of, of I2B2? Because I think that might be a you know, roadblock for, for some minds when people think they have to transfer the data to one central point. They don't really know and they don't know what happens to the data. In contrast to a point um, we know, like a, a safe data storage uh, where the data is being transmitted and you just can uh, use the data. You send you queries and get some uh, results back, some aggregated results, maybe maybe some uses some more results. I think that might be the roadblock in, in many heads for uh, transferring the data to, to one of those institutions. Could you just quickly contrast and, and, and the modus operandi you chose? Yeah, so if I get your uh, the, your question correctly, what is the difference between, you know, a federated approach and having data transferred to one place, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, I yeah, think this yeah. should be, it should be yeah. told, out, told out bluntly that there is a yeah. huge difference privacy yeah. wise. Yes, there is a huge difference privacy, uh, privacy wise. And I think that was a difference between the N3C and the 4CE, right? And, and the 4CE is taking this approach that it is a federated model. You don't share your patient level data only the population level data. And I think uh, 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 because the N3C you know, approach of having it at the centralized approach, uh, I think Griffin talks very well about it. So uh, that, uh, th 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 again, th that is very, has to be protected, right? Because you can never guarantee complete de-identification. And, uh, and, uh, and obviously there is a lot of movement involved of data and you know, it, it is heavy, it is heavy work. 4C is light, you know, the federated approach is light and it allows people to quickly come on board. So I think there is a value in allowing people to take, have ownership and, but that, that API which they are going to expose, whether it is going to be a pull or whether also they can be a pull or they can be a push. Like in the ACT network, it's a pull where you can run a query and get back an answer. When 4C, it's a push where you deposit the file. So uh, I think, yeah, those are the con contrasting points. Um, uh, I think it will take a longer discussion to uh, delve into it, but I think uh, that that is my thinking, immediate thing which comes, come, uh, which I can share with you. Uh, excellent. I, thank you. I think there is another question from uh, Chi from InterSystems that many EHR systems offer POP health management solution already. How would I2B2 ecosystem differentiate from EMR vendor PHN solutions? Um, actually, I should. Uh, 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 yeah, I, I, I think uh, I looked at, so I've looked at some of these population management system for decision support, for example, right? And I think they are pretty, uh, uh, I think they require a lot of work. Uh, I think the brain power that we have in the community uh, and, and maybe things have changed, you know, but I, th I think that uh, they, they do lack uh, the, the solutions which are there and I2B2, uh, uh, the, the I2B2 community can have, has a lot, has a lot to contribute over there. And it, we have less than just, we have just less than one minute. Sorry. Yeah. I think, so the, I, I think that, that, that that's my take. Uh, I think we shouldn't depend on big corporations to do these things. Uh, like someone said in MGH, uh, you know, uh, we, we shouldn't do this and, you know, and, and mums was invented because we didn't, depend on big corporations to invent and to take on these problems. Uh, it's, it's up to us to do it. Thank you.